Hi, and we're back. So now that we've heard how we approach spam fighting at Facebook, we should really hear about how we actually build a systems of doing this. Um, as you probably know, this is really hard. For anybody that has an infrastructure team, you, you probably know that we have to bribe the engineers on that team to do things for us. And for our next speaker, we bribe him with uh, Polish vodka. Uh, please welcome Marcin Pawlowski. Actually, this should work. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to say that you can also bribe me with other alcohols. That's also fine. Um, oh, there's a speaker. So let's start. Oh, that's okay. Everything's good. Uh, so our the the thing we want to do looks simple. We are the infrastructure team. We are supposed to take a rule from our great spam fighters, take the request that's coming from people, run the rule, say, is it bad, stop it. If it's not, carry on. Basically, we are there to provide a black box that will take all the rules, will be sitting between the people and our databases, and make sure nothing bad gets to the databases, and nothing get, if something bad did get there, nothing bad will get back to the people. And everyone will be happy with this design. It's beautiful. It gives instant feedback, instant response. The problem is, in life, in every group of happy people, you will find one malcontent. <laughs> and he will tell you that this is not going to work. Why? Because you're on the synchronous path between people and their data. You are blocking them. You cannot take too long. This system is very latency sensitive. Each time you delay my message by one second, I'm one second more angry. And you saw me, I'm angry. <laughs> and this means you have to be very, very careful with your checks. So what you will soon end up with is a system like this, where you only perform very fast checks on the synchronous path. And then later on, when you're no longer bounded by time, you can do something heavier, something that is smarter. And as we are no longer bound by time, we can log. And we can do some stuff with our logs. So what can we do with our logs? Uh, for first, we can aggregate. You saw those counters in the uh, previous uh, talks. Then you can fire your machine learning, teach your linear regression, and find all the spam ever. And Thirdly, you can, for example, cluster things which look similar and maybe then do something more, something smarter with your clusters. So what you end up with is a system which looks like this. A little bit better than what we started with because we are equipped with the data we processed from our logs. So our asynchronous calls, which are heavy, also provide data for our synchronous calls. But our synchronous calls still have to be really fast. So in today's talk, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, how we execute rule, how our rules, how our execution engine works. And I will mainly be focused on this uh, synchronous, synchronous path. We actually use it also uh, for asynchronous path, but that's mainly because it works pretty well. So why not? Then I will talk about aggregating data. How do we aggregate? How do we store data? and to make it available also on the fast path, for example. And finally, I will talk about class, our clustering infrastructure. So let's start with how do we execute rules. As you have seen in the talk from Pinterest, rules are usually fairly simple things. Yes, the logic is extremely simple. Just compare two values, take some ratios, say block or not. Looks very simple. But when you look a little bit deeper into that, it turns out that the logic of the rule directs what's needed, what data is needed for execution. You don't, usually your quick checks at the beginning will define, actually I don't need anything more. So if you were to prefetch everything that you ever could possibly need for this rule, that would be extremely expensive, that would hit your latency, your database people would be very angry for you uh, about this, and the throughput, even network throughput to your system could be too big. So you want your execution engine to be able to smartly fetch. Smartly is lazily, only the things that you need. Secondly, 
as latency matters, when we have independent rules that fetch independent data, you would like to go fetch once and wait once. You do not want to do it sequentially. You do not want, in essence, execute your rules sequentially. You want at least data fetchers to be overlapping so that you save on that. So you want to be really smart about optimizing for your data fetches, optimizing your scheduling. And the third very big thing is that we really want to move fast. In the Pinterest talk, you heard a lot about moving fast, detecting stuff quickly, writing code quickly. But whenever we write code quickly, we push it to production, there's a big risk. We will break something. And imagine that you write a rule, and you just log at the very end of the rule. There's nothing that could go wrong, yeah? In principle, there shouldn't be. But if you are allowed to modify the state in such a way that it's visible to other rules, you can end up in a situation when you write this innocent rule and you break everything. You start blocking all the people on Facebook. So what you want is to ensure that your rules cannot visibly change state for any other rule. I will now state something without any proof. And uh, let's say that proof is homework. Uh, all we need for our rule engine is pure functions and smart data fetching. By pure functions, I mean functions that uh, only compute the result based on the input and do not modify the state, basically functional programming. And data fetching, smart data fetching, I try to explain why. There's a great talk by Louis Brandy, present there, uh, about Husks. Huxle. This is our rule engine that executes our rules. It's, uh, it's executing only Haskell, and as of four or five days, all our Facebook rules for spam detection are running on top of Haskell. And uh, Huxel itself, the name, refers to the library that we built on top of normal Huxel execution to do this smart data fetching. And you can find the talk in the references. Now let's talk about aggregating data. In spam fighting, and I hope it was also visible from the previous talk, it's a very common pattern that we need some count of events over time period. And once we have the count, we do some testing, we do the binomial test, and we know it's good, bad, suspicious, whatever. And the very repetitive thing here is that we are interested in some recent period of time. We do not want to classify a URL, uh, maybe URL is a bad example, an IP. We do not want to classify an IP as bad because it was bad for past year, but last, for last week it cleared up. We want to be able to see last week cleared up, and we don't want the last year to mess up the history forever. And vice versa. If something was good, we don't want to still be looking at the history of good from the past. We want to look at recent time. So the time window counters, counters that answer the question, how many events happen in a given recent time window, are extremely useful for spam fighting. An example from the previous talk, where we want to uh, see the cold opens. We have cold open counter over a week, a total counter over a week. Extremely useful finds anomalies. OK, so how, how do we store this data? How do we make it available? And we want to make it available also on synchronous path, which is latency sensitive. OK, we can, for example, store it as uh, plainly in the database. Uh, so let's store all requests uh, or all opens for URL tiny.com. And then when we need to count them, let's just fetch everything. In that case, it means we have to have an index for the fetch to be relatively fast. But what if, we ha if this URL is actually very popular? We need to fetch maybe 20,000 items. It's, there's no way we will be able to do that in the reasonable time. And even if we did, we have 20,000 things to scan through and say, OK, this was the cold, this was the hot. It's still too much. So what we have to do is uh, we have to pre-aggregate. We have to pre-aggregate data. We have to compute some statistics before we need them. Then we can store it in some storage, which will give us fast access. So when we need it, we have it readily available. 
So low latency for reads is important. For writes, actually the update latency for our data structure that we store, it depends. You may, if you want to use it for rate limiting, probably it has to be really fast. But if you want to use it for spam detection, usually you have a little bit of time. So what do we want? We want uh, time windows. We want counts over time windows. That's for sure. We want compact representation. Just because if we don't have compact representation, we will not be able to fetch it on time. We want to support counts from zero to millions or even billions. Why is that? Because we don't want our spam fighters to consistently be thinking, okay, should I use this, should I use this? Oh, this will be low count, this will be high count, and then it turns out you found the URL facebook.com, which turns out is way more popular than you thought. And finally, as you saw, when we do testing for spam, we usually look at distributions, we approximate stuff, so you do not have to provide perfect count over this time window. It's sufficient, it's approximate enough. Again, approximate enough depends on the use case, but in most cases, 10, 20% off is okay. So the solution to this problem are streaming data structures. Uh, streaming uh, is uh, nowadays a discipline in computer science, which deals with computing statistics or computing properties of streams of data that are so big that we cannot fit them in a memory of a computer or even a memory of a data center. And when you have such a stream, we want to compute some property of this stream, and maybe we are okay with approximating, but we have the requirement that computation should be fairly cheap and should be very bounded in space. So all those papers that are dealing with streaming are always discussing the trade-offs between accuracy, space, speed. We want time window model. Time window streaming is usually defined a bit differently than for us. For us, we, we want like last day. In a uh, streaming world, it's usually last n elements. But those two definitions are actually usually pretty convertible. Examples of streaming data structures that we use are Top K, QDigest, DGIM, and sliding hyperloglo. I will discuss uh, the last two of those. All of those are, uh, are mentioned in the, uh, at the end in references. So DGIM data structures, by the way, this is just, I didn't know how to name it. This is the names of the authors of the paper. There are four guys. Uh, we call them signals at Facebook. And they provide a very simple thing, count of events over time. For example, number of times an URL was shared over the last four seconds. Problem looks simple, but we want to be very bounded in storage, and we want to support cardinalities, for example, of a billion. So I will not show the full data structures. We will simplify the problem very slightly. Instead of having a stream of non-negative numbers, let's have just a binary stream. We have huge binary stream, and we want to answer questions of the form, how many ones have we seen among last k elements? So what do we do with the stream? We get the stream, we split it into buckets. And there are a couple, few rules about how do we split into buckets. Each bucket has to start with one. Each bucket has to contain power of two number of ones. And we can only have two or three buckets of the same size. Only the last bucket can be uh, singular. And finally, bucket sizes are increasing. Those are all the rules that are required. Once we have that, here's the split. We have three buckets of size one, three buckets of size two. To represent the bucket, it's sufficient to just store the start of the bucket, the index of the first element, and the size of the bucket. But we know they are power of two, so actually it's sufficient to store the logarithm of the size. So we have a very complex presentation. And then when we want to answer a query of how many uh, events happened over the last uh, five elements, we just count the number of elements in all the buckets that are fully within time period of five. And for the last bucket that may start within five, but does not necessarily end with five, 
within five, we just take half. Extremely simple. This already has an uh, error bound of 25%, and it's deterministic. You can, change, you can adjust the parameter of the number of buckets uh, that you can have, and this can have arbitrary low error. Uh, second data structure I want to discuss is sliding hyperlog log. This is a little bit more complex concept. It allows us to answer a question of the form, how many unique items have we seen? So we want to remove duplicates. For example, how many different people shared this URL over time period? And this is a pretty complex data structure, so I will simplify the problem. Let's have a stream and let's just count how many different items are there in the stream without the time piece. So how do we do it? The principle is very simple. For every item in the stream, let's hash it. And then let's count the number of leading zeros in the hash. Once we have this count, we only store the maximal count ever seen so far in this stream. And when we want to answer the query, how many unique items have we seen in the stream, we just say two to the number we stored. And this already has the right expectation. Of course, if we use this simplistic approach, this has, will have huge variance and will not be really useful. So we use some statistical averaging here, uh, but that's the principle of the algorithm. Uh, and then there's the sli sliding version, which is discu discussed in the references. So the system looks fairly simple. We have our huge log. We feed this log to a set of servers. Those servers read the data from the database, the old value of the data structure. They apply the update, and they send it back. The one thing we do is we batch updates. So if some key is extremely hot, it has thousands of updates, we will batch five seconds of those updates and read it once, write it once. That means, from the perspective of our databases, there are no hot keys for writes. Everything is pretty much uniform. And we basically pay the cost of hot keys in CPU. So some key decisions that we made designing the system. Uh, this is purely key value store. We only allow point query. You cannot go for a range. You have to know exactly what you are looking for. Our writes can be delayed, but thanks to that, we save on hot keys all the problems of hot keys. We have extremely simple deletion policy, which is if something was not updated for a number of days, we just delete it. And in our database, that's a, almost for free operation. I don't know if you are familiar with RocksDB. It basically has a lazy deletion. And finally, we have no retries. What do I mean? Whenever a write database fail or something like this, we don't care. And like, what do you mean we don't care? You just failed a write to a database. The thing is, our data structures are statistical. If we introduce 1% error, like, it doesn't really matter. We didn't break anything yet. The, however, it depends heavily on the assumption that this 1% error is uniformly distributed among your keys. And this assumption is usually not true. Usually it's a few things that fail and everything else works. And you have to be able to measure, measure this and be sure that your distribution is uniform over entire space. It turns out that all those cool things, all those cool data structures are not enough. Spammers can go around them. That was mentioned um, in the previous talk when we were talking uh, about the event-based classification. Spammers can move slowly. They measure, they adjust, and then we will end up in a situation where our signals, our unique signals, give us some sense that, yeah, this is kind of suspicious, but I'm not confident enough to make any decision. So what do we do next? How do we find that? One of our answers is clustering. You can, and in clustering, we, ba we are basically, what do we want to do is group together items that are similar. And it doesn't matter what are those items, like maybe photos, maybe text, maybe files. We just want to group together similar items. And for the purpose of spam fighting, we want to limit the definition of uh, similarity to very narrow context, which is items that are modifications of each other. In other words, items that come from one common source with 
slightly slight modifications. Why? Because if we go for things like concepts, this becomes dangerous. It's very easy to go in the concept and have lots of false positives. We just want to basically look at stuff that is repetitive and that is computer generated. And when we do clustering, we do not want to at all look at notion of good, bad, whatever. We just want to group together items that look similar. The power of clustering was already explained in the previous talk. Uh, but also, when you, not, when you are not looking at the rules themselves that detect spam, clustering becomes very powerful because it allows you to see similarities. You, when you are researching an attack, and you see, okay, I see this, this account got hijacked, and you see it's in a, in a cluster. You go to the cluster and you look at all the accounts that got hijacked. And suddenly you can see common patterns. You can see things that will allow you to detect this attack in general. Maybe this one point would not strike you, but this group, this is much more powerful concept. Um, well, something wrong. Secondly, if you have a method to manually create clusters out of single piece of content, suddenly the game changes. Because every time you manually see a piece of spam, you can remember your decision forever and protect with this de decision your network forever. Everything that will be similar forever will be attached to this cluster that you manually created and will be marked as bad. So your decisions suddenly become more powerful. And finally, the cluster classification thing that uh, Gigi talked uh, just before. And the thing is, creating content is expensive. And if you have the power to just take down all modification of this content, you increase the cost for spammers. So your manual cluster creation becomes, again, extremely powerful. So what is the problem with clustering? You will soon see that when you have millions of photos or hundreds of millions of photos, you just cannot store them on a single server and cluster them. With files, it's similar. So you have to build this complex system for clustering, which will handle files, photos, text, this, that, and it has to scale to storing terabytes of data or do something crazy. And for each kind of item, you will have a different distance metric, so you will have to optimize your clustering for each of these distance metrics. And this gets com 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 more complex and more complex each time you add something new. It's very resistive to quick iteration. So what we did is we decided to split the problem into two smaller subproblems. Both of them are pretty well described in the scientific lit literature. First of all, we want to reduce the dimensionality of our input object using locality-sensitive hashing. What do I mean by locality-sensitive hashing? We want to take an object, hash it losing, using a hash function into some binary hash, and the property we want from our hashing function is that similar objects will hash to similar hashes. Yeah, I know, easy to say. Uh, that's what we want, that's the assumption. And once we have these binary hashes, we want to just cluster the hashes. We are agnostic to what they are coming from. We just built one infrastructure to clustering hashes. And you can imagine that if your hashes are, for example, 256 bit, that's already not that small hash. You can store half a billion photos of that hash to this in just 32 gigs of memory. That's not much. That's one machine. Okay, so now let's talk about hashing itself. Let's, let's go through an example. I will talk about Neil Simsa hash. A hash developed, uh, I think, 2007, something like this, uh, for spam finding. Uh, it tries to hash text into binary hashes in a way that will preserve similarity. How do we do that? We take a piece of text, we roll a window of five characters over this text. So from six characters, we have two windows. And for each window, we take every triplet of letters. And we hash it using a hash function that returns a value from 0 to 255. And let's say for ABB, the hash function return 3. 
So then we create an array of 256 counters. We go at position 3, and we increase this position. And we repeat that. Basically, we arrive at the end with 256 counters. And to normalize it, because some text is shorter, some text is longer, what we do is we just, from each counter, we subtract the average of all counters, which means what we end up with is relative uh, distribution or relative count of uh, items with which hash to this position versus the average, if we are above average or below average. So if we are above average, we say bit is 1. If we are below average, we say bit is 0. And probably, again, homework, you can see that uh, this has the property that small modification will not change hash much. But this hash is extremely uh, supervised. We know exactly what we are doing. We handle only text, and it does not generalize at all. Not to mention that, truth to be told, you have to normalize your text before anyway. So as this was very specific to the uh, purpose, and we want to be able to experiment quickly, we developed a framework to uh, basically develop hashes uh, on the fly. How does it work? Uh, basically, we, w we decided that the <coughs> best representation for everything is just a vector of doubles. That's how you have to represent your features. That's how, you, that, that's how you represent your features. And we will train a locality-sensitive hash for you. We will learn it. You just have to provide us your data, which is arbitrary length vector of doubles. We will train a locality-sensitive hash for you. And as an output, you'll be getting a bit vector. How it works, uh, again, uh, we can talk afterwards. But Having that, basically, you can reduce anything which is, has very high dimensionality to your small hashes. To give an example, you can take a middle layer of your neural network, which will have some scores, let's say 5,000 scores, and you can just dump it to locality-sensitive hashing. And once you have that, you have basically everything to experiment with new kinds of clustering. You just get some features. Make sure they are doubles. Yeah, I know it's not that easy, but it's not so limiting anymore. Then you train your uh, dimensionality reduction model, which is basically locality-sensitive hash, and then you verify. How do you verify? Like, truth to be told, just cluster it and see what you get. Do you get what you expected or you don't? Do you have false positives? That way you can experiment pretty quickly. The pipeline uh, for our clustering that we use in production is also fairly simple. Whenever you get an item, you hash it. Then you send it to a matching service. Matching service has a quick match against a database of all known clusters. If it matches, you do whatever you need to do to attach. If it doesn't match, you send it to the clustering service. Clustering service does the online cluster creation. And how it does it? It's also fairly simple. It kills partial clusters. One, those cl once those clusters get big enough to be saved to database, we just save them to database, and this database is picked up by matching service. Mm. And we have to do it that way, because if we were just to create a cluster out of every single item, we just would have too many of them, and the uh, matching service would not be able to match so quickly. And how do we do online, online clustering? Again, fairly simple idea. We take a window of items. For example, we want in each clustering round, we want to have a million of items. So we wait until we have a million of items. Then for each item, we first check this item against our partial clusters, which we have in the clustering service. If it matches, we attach. If it doesn't match, we save it. And at the end of this, for all the hashes that were saved and didn't match, we just cluster them together using k-means. At the end, we remove some old uh, partial clusters to not run out of memory. And if some cluster goes below, uh, above the threshold, we just save it to the database. So there are some trade-offs we had to make here. And they're pretty clearly visible. This system is not designed for huge accuracy. We will not catch all the clusters. 
it's optimized to catch big things. You can easily avoid being detected if you go slow. If in each hour of our windows you, let's say, put only one of your uh, pieces of content. But this already forced you to go slow. And that's our win. Secondly, we always uh, pick our threshold so that uh, we avoid false clustering. Because we often uh, take actions on clusters. And false clustering uh, means attaching item that does not belong to the cluster to the cluster would mean that we will have a false positive in our spam detection. So we much rather have like three clusters, which in reality are representing one logical big cluster, than one cluster that is slightly too big. And finally, the time window thing. The longer the time window, the more accurate you are, the better you will be at clustering. However, it also increases your latency, your time to react when you see a new cluster. Because as you see, once the cluster is created, we will match online to this cluster. So everything will get attached, uh, get attached instantly. So it's also good to have those clusters soon. But the shorter the time window, the less accuracy you have. So now it's time for some end notes. Uh, the summary is basically know your requirements and adjust. In some places, you have to be very fast. And the only thing that matters is how smart is your I.O. And safety also matters. In some places, you can be approximate. Make use of that. Do not promise spam fighters that will, they will have perfect results. Tell them that they will have approximate results. They will learn to use it. And you will be able, <laughs> <laughs> and you will be able uh, to be really fast and have lots of those results. This may be more useful than having few, but exact. And it's, it's a repetitive pattern that we heard before, that we have so much data that we cannot analyze it. So think about value the compactness of data. If you can somehow do, use locality-sensitive hashing or other methods to make your data compact and still preserve at least some of its value, do it. It's worth it. It really allows you to simplify your systems, experiment, and do stuff quickly. OK? Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, mm -hmm. When you uh, want to try out a new signal uh, or a new feature, are you relearning the locale sensitive hashing and reclustering over all your data? Um, and how does that iterative process work for doing feature engineering? Thanks. So, uh, the question uh, you're asking if when I want to use new locality sensitive hashing, yes? Because when, when I want to use a new feature to describe some object. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you have to yes, you have to learn your uh, your uh, locality sensitive hashing. So what you can do is uh, we have a method to basically dump your data uh, into the learning framework and then dump your data to your clustering. If you want to train all of your data, all of your old, if you want to have clustering on all of your old data using new locality sensitive hashing function, you have to recluster. And that, that's also not so trivial, because this assumes you still have the content that originally produced it. And this is, in many, many cases, not true, because it got deleted. Uh, something happened, and we have an obligation to delete stuff after some time. So introducing new hashing is rather looking in future than looking in past, or maybe not that so distant past. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to picture the photo clustering case in the case where you have two images, the same image but different sizes. So do you have to pre-process in some way to normalize things like that for the clustering of images? So uh, the question was, if we have two images of different sizes, do we have to pre-process to uh, still have this good locality-sensitive hashing? Uh, the answer is, uh, usually, no, like we do not pre-process, and usually it still works. We, what we use for hashing photos is an uh, intermediate layer of neural network. 
And this network is actually used to detect concepts. So it's not real, this network is, shouldn't be in principle. Uh, really, um, it should be really resistive to changing the aspect of the photo. And as it's already an intermediate representation, this usually does not change much, as long as you do not change content. Of course, like locality-sensitive hashing of photos, it's really, really hard to be uh, resistive to everything. Like if you're, we can be resistive to changing the size of the photo, changing uh, rotation of the photo, but if you find, if you if you look really, really hard, you will find some weakness. If we have no more questions, uh, we're gonna take an hour to go to lunch. Um, every time I talk to people on the infrastructure team, my mind just kind of explodes. So this is the good time to go get.